morning, we're going to start a new series, The Fruit of the Spirit. And the first one is love. All right. And this passage of scripture describes the fruit of the spirit. It's found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. And it reads like this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. In the Tony Evans Bible commentary, he writes this of today's passage. He says, works are something that you do motivated by your flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is something produced through you by the Spirit as you respond to his urgings. And he refers, he references John 7, 38 to 39, which reads, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believe in him were to receive. Now the sources are different and their outcomes are different, but just as works of the flesh are visible to us, so also is the fruit of the spirit. You can't miss it. And make no mistake, fruit always bears the character of the tree that produces it. Apples don't produce oranges. You don't display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life without the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and the fruit of the Spirit is the life and character of Christ produced in us as we walk in fellowship with him. And while works of the flesh destroy the fruit of the Spirit, <clears throat> while works of the flesh destroy... The fruit of the Spirit provides life and refreshment. It benefits others. To love is to seek another person's good, especially when that person can do nothing for you in return. We see the benefit of loving others in the next illustration. Are you ready? In a short story by Alan Loy McGinnis entitled Love's Power, he shares about Viktor Frankl, a Viennese Jew who was interned by the Germans for more than three years. He was moved from one concentration camp to another, even spending several months at Auschwitz. Dr. Frankel said that he learned early that one way to survive was to shave every morning, no matter how sick you were, even if you had to use a piece of broken glass as a razor. For every morning, as the prisoners stood for review, the sickly ones who would not be able to work that day were sent to the gas chambers. And if you were shaven and your face looked ruddier for it, your chances of escaping death that day were much, much better. Their bodies wasted away on the daily fare of just 10 and a half, half ounces of bread and one and three quarter pints of thin gruel. They slept on bare boards, tiers seven feet wide, seven men to a tier. They shared two blankets together. Three shrill whistles awoke them for work at 3 a.m., one morning, as they marched out to lay railroad ties in the frozen ground miles from the camp, the accompanying guards kept shouting and driving them with the butts of their rifles, and anyone with sore feet supported himself on his neighbor's arm. The man next to Frankel, hiding his mouth behind an upturned collar, whispered, if our wives could see us now, huh? I do hope they're better off in their camps and don't know what's happening to us. Frankel wrote this, that brought thoughts of my own wife to mind. And as we stumbled on for miles, slipping on icy spots, supporting each other time and again, dragging one another up and onward, nothing was said. But we both knew. Each of us was thinking of his wife. Occasionally I looked at the sky where the stars were fading and the pink light of the morning was beginning to spread behind a dark bank of clouds. But my mind clung to my wife's image, imagining it with an uncanny acuteness. I heard her answering me saw her smile, her frank and encouraging look. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as, as it is said into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom of so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning. Oh, that's what happened. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through the love, through love, and in love. The love Frankel had for his wife kept him going. So too, it helped him appreciate the love that provided for his salvation. 
Scripture says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is affectionately referred to as Christians as the love chapter. Other verses in chapter 13 are also familiar regarding love. For instance, 4 to 8a, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And then we take that in conjunction with today's passage. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, against these things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. You know, love is probably the most misunderstood word in the world. It's actually quite difficult to define. Did you ever do that? Whenever I do premarital counseling, I ask the couple, each one individually, to define love. It's excruciating. (laughs) It's a very hard thing to define. So many different forms expressed and realized in so many different ways. But I think that most of us know it when we see it, don't we? And when we experience it. And the other part that makes it misunderstood is that we abuse the word love. Yes, we do. That is, we use it to describe so many different things. We use it to say everything from when I say, I love my wife. I love America. I love the color we painted the house. I love my dog. I love pepperoni pizza. I love triple peanut butter ice cream. I love my new shoes. We use the word love in so many different ways that it's lost or at least confused or muted its meaning. Most people think, Love is a feeling, simply an emotion, an ocean of emotion. It is true that love produces feelings, but it's really more than an emotion. It's more than a feeling. Cue Boston, right? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Okay, some of you that are at least 60 know what I'm talking about. Look it up on YouTube. I think you'll be able to find it. It's more than a feeling by Boston, okay? Anyway, I'm showing my age. What else is new? (coughs) Pardon me. Those of you out there that are prone to pray, pray that I don't cough so much through this message today, okay? Please, thank you. How often do we let our feelings motivate us to do all kinds of things that we normally wouldn't do, right? It's almost like saying when we're in love, everything is just out of control. Have you ever heard someone say, have you said, I fell in love? It makes it sound as if they tripped and they couldn't control the fall, right? Hank Williams used to sing about it when he sang, I can't help it if I'm, still love, um, if I'm still in love with you. Probably somebody here knows that song well enough to sing it. Okay? We talk as if love is uncontrollable. And some of you probably are thinking, well, yeah, yeah. If I would have, could choose who I would fall in love with, I would have married that lout. But anyway, I think, believe, or, or feel that way. But well, the Bible tells us otherwise. Not not just the Bible, we're talking about the man himself. Jesus commands that we love others. He said in John 13, 34, a new command, I give you love one another. As I have loved you, so you can choose to love one another. Is that what it says? No, it says you must, must, so you must love one another. No options here, you must. So it would seem that love is a matter of choice. And later in the Bible, It says in Colossians 3.14, and over or beyond all these virtues or things, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Notice those two small words, put on. Love is something we can choose to have. If it were just a feeling, we couldn't command it. But we can command a choice, and love is a choice. It's controllable. It can be directed, dare I say harnessed, It is much more than feelings, to be sure, but love is a choice we make every day to love one another or to love others. The fact is that it's possible to love someone you don't even like. It is. 
Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, 44 to 46. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? I think it's interesting. He thought of the worst possible reference he could, tax collectors. (coughs) Okay? You know, it is easy to love people who are kind and lovely. It is much more difficult to love those who are not. But the fact remains, our lives are full of people who we may not like or even care for. And my friends, don't be sold what people are trying to sell when they tell us today, when you say don't like, that's not hate. Don't like and hate are two different things. It doesn't make us a hater, even though the politically correct police have mischaracterized it as such. We don't like the way some people talk. We may not care for the way people put things or what they say. It doesn't mean you hate them. You just disagree. We don't like the way some people act or maybe even the choices they make. We don't like the way others dress, and that may just be the members of our family. You don't hate them. But most of all, we do tend to not care for people or don't like people who don't like us. We, don't, we tend to not like people who don't like us. Lady Astor, the first female member of British House of Commons, did not like Winston Churchill, and he was a boisterous figure. And it seems that he didn't care much for her either. One time she told him, Winston, if you were my husband, I'd poison your tea. <laughs> to which Churchill replied, Madam, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. <laughs> my guess is... If you were to think about it for a minute or so, you could probably come up with a list of people who do not particularly like or you don't particularly like or care much for. They would probably be people with whom you've had trouble getting along, right? But the truth is everyone is hard to love some of the time, even you and especially me. But some people are hard to love anytime. Jesus never demanded that we have warm, fuzzy feelings for everyone, but he did tell us that we're to love people We don't have to like everyone, but we do have to love them. Do you remember Margaret Maybe? She used to say that all the time. She'd come around with that pink clipboard, smack you on top of the head and say, you need to do this. And then she says, but remember, you still got to love me or something like that. Do you remember her doing that? Yeah. You have to, if you want to get to heaven, you got to love me. Okay. But anyway, the question is, how do we do that? Now, I'm not talking about Margaret anymore. Uh, how, How do we do this? Well, steps that we have to learn to love people. Number one, experience God's love yourself. Before we can love others, we have to understand how deeply God loves us. I mean, we just celebrated communion, right? Man, if that doesn't demonstrate it, I don't know what does. Romans 5, 6, 8. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless or helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for the righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us while we were still sinners, while we were opposed to him, while we were still in our rebellious state, God loved us even though we didn't love him. We find in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. And what a love it is. It's a sacrificial love. That's why we read this in John three sixteen and experience again today through communion. Like I said, for God so loved the world that he gave gave us his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, you might ask yourself the question, why is it important to feel loved by God? Why? Well, because unloved people are very often unloving people. When I do not feel genuinely loved, I do not feel like giving love. So to become a loving person, we have to experience God's love ourselves. And Jesus said in John 15, 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. In the ESV, it says, this, com- this is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. His love for us, that's the model. That's the model by which we're to love. What else are we supposed to do? Well, another step would be to forgive your enemies. Learning to love others is forgiving those who have hurt us. In Colossians 3, 3 12 to 13, 
Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against, against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The forgiveness that we're to show to others is the forgiveness that Jesus showed us. Now, most, if not all people, have been hurt at one point in time in their lives or another. But we have to let go of the past and get on with the present. We need to begin loving people today. We must close the door in the past, and that can't happen without forgiveness. If there's forgiveness, you have a shot at that. Forgive those who have hurt you for your sake, not because they deserve it, because honestly, they may or may not deserve it. But do it so your heart can be whole again. Set it free. Set it free so that it's not bogged down by the weight or the baggage of the hurt or the hurtful acts. The people that hurt from your past cannot continue to hurt you today unless you allow them to hurt you by holding on to your grudges and or resentment against them. Anytime you resent someone, you give that person a piece of your heart, a portion of your attention, a piece of your mind or consciousness, space in your thoughts. Do you want that person to have that? I doubt it. So why not take it back by forgiving them? Forgive those who hurt you. Instead of rehearsing that hurt over and over, release it and set it free. Number three, think loving thoughts. your ears. God's word reminds us of this in Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, what does it mean to think loving thoughts? It means we begin to focus on the needs of other people, their hurts, their problems, their desires, their goals, not just our own. And as the old saying goes, it's easier to understand someone else when we walk a mile in their shoes. And my friends, here is another reality. Like before, hurting people are the ones who tend to hurt people. Hurting people will hurt other people. If someone is hurting you, that person is doing so because he or she is hurting over something. We need to look beyond people's faults so that we can see their needs. Then we can learn to love. Have you ever noticed that the most, absolutely most obnoxious people and the least lovable people are those who absolutely need, the lo need love the most? The people we'd rather ignore are the very ones who desperately need massive doses of love. Everyone, everyone needs love and attention. If a person can't get love, they'll strive to get attention and love in some way. And if they can't find positive love and attention, they will look to find it anywhere. They can get it. And what they often find is negative attention and destructive love. Subconsciously, they're saying, I will be noticed. I will be loved one way or another. The fourth thing we should do is behave in a loving way. Now, some of you might, may want to say, or, or you're thinking, Pastor Dan, you're telling me to act lovingly towards someone I don't even like. I can't do that. That's hypocritical. Well, not exactly. Not really. I'm calling us to being faithful to Jesus. What do you mean? Well, here's what I mean. He's the one who said this in Luke chapter 6. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. In this passage alone, we're instructed to do four specific things. Jesus first commanded us to love our enemies. How do we love someone who's hurting us? Well, we have to overlook their faults. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Second, Jesus commands us to do good. How do we do good to people we don't even like? Well, we look for ways to give to them. What can we do to serve them, meet their needs, help and benefit them? We can give. We can go the second mile. We can offer practical help. We can do them a favor. We can discover their needs and respond to them. Third, 
Jesus commands us to bless those who curse us. What does he mean by that? He's referring to the way we talk about and talk to those who treat us badly. Can you tell if people are getting along just by their conversation? Why is that? Because of the things they're saying and how they're saying it, their body language, their cadence, their volume, all that stuff, right? A blessing is a positive word spoken to or about others. We don't put them down. We lift them up. We encourage them. Fourth, Jesus commands us to pray for those who mistreat us. Praying for people will not only change them, but think about this. It changes us too, doesn't it? Doesn't prayer change us? When you try to pray for somebody else, it's kind of hard to still, right? So how should we pray? We pray that God will bless people who are mistreating us because the goodness of God leads to repentance. Perhaps God will bless those people so much that they'll want to change. But even if they don't change right away, praying for them will change your attitude towards them. What all this means is that love is an action. Remember we read all those action things in 1 Corinthians 13 in the earlier passage, love is patient, love is kind, and so much more. Do you know in that passage there are 15 action words in those verses, 15 action words. When we act lovingly, we're patient, we're gentle, and kind. We're displaying the fruit that's mentioned. It's actually the fruit. All the other fruit listed is, are simply expressions of love. When you think about it, love is patient, love is kind, love is joyful, love is the basis of all positive actions. Amen, that's right, preach it. Number five, expect the best. Expect the best. Now, I have to be <laughs> very candid here. In some ways, I actually think this might be the most difficult. Why? Because as we grow older, our experience so often runs contrary to that principle. But I would also add, and I absolutely believe this, that we tend to see what we look for. Over time, we can become a bit jaded. So if you're looking for evidence to the contrary, you're going to find it virtually every time. But so too it would seem that if we expect and look for the best, we can also find it virtually every time. It can be a matter of perspective. So expect the best, even of those you don't like. 1 Corinthians 13a, love never fails. Love has a power that we can't even imagine. It never, ever fails. We should expect the best. And as Christians, we have have always been a people of hope, a people of faith. The reason for that is because we serve a God who is always faithful in Romans 8, 38 to 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, or nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> I have a rather lengthy illustration that I would like to share. It's called The Crumpled Photograph, and it's by Philip Yancey. One holiday, I was visiting my mother who lives 700 miles away. We reminisced about times long past, as mothers and sons tend to do. Inevitably, the large box of old photos came down from the closet shelf, spilling out a jumbled pile of thin rectangles that marked my progression through childhood and adolescence. The cowboy and the Indian get-ups, probably not allowed to say that anymore, but anyway, the cowboy and the Indian get-ups, the Peter Cottontail suit in the first grade play, my childhood pets, Endless piano recitals, the graduations from grade school and high school and finally college. Among those photos, I found one of an infant with my name written on the back. The portrait itself was not unusual. I looked like any baby, fat-cheeked, half-bald, with a wild, unfocused look to my eyes. But the photo was crumpled and mangled as if a childhood pet had gotten a hold of it. I asked my mother why she had hung on to such an abused photo when she had so many other undamaged, pristine ones. There's something you should know about my family. When I was 10 months old, my father contracted spiner, spinal lumbar polio. Spinal lumbar polio. He died three months later, just after my first birthday. <coughs> my father was totally paralyzed at age 24. His muscles so weakened that he had to live inside a large steel cylinder that did his breathing for him. He had few visitors. People had as much hysteria about polio in the 1950s as they did about AIDS in the early stages in more recent times. 
The one visitor who came faithfully, my mother, would sit in a certain place so that he could see her in a mirror that was attached to the iron lung. My mother explained to me that she kept the photo as a memento because during my father's illness, it had been fastened to his iron lung. He had asked for pictures of her and his two sons, and my mother had to jam the pictures in between some metal knobs. So, the crumpled condition of my baby photo. I rarely saw my father after he entered the hospital since children were not allowed in polio wards. Besides, I was so young that even if I had been allowed in, I would not now retain those memories. When my mother told me the story of the crumpled photo, I had a strange and powerful reaction. It seemed odd to imagine someone caring about me whom, in a sense, I had never met. During the last months of his life, my father had spent his waking hours staring at those three images of his family, my family. There was nothing else in his field of view. What did he do all day? Did he pray for us? Yes, surely. Did he love us? Yes, but how can a paralyzed person express his love, especially when his own children are banned from the room? I have often thought of that crumpled photo, for it is one of the few links connecting me to the stranger who was my father, a stranger who died a decade younger than I am now, someone I have no memory of, no sensory knowledge of, spent all day, every day thinking of me, devoting himself to me, loving me as well as he could. Perhaps in some mysterious way he is doing so now in another dimension. Perhaps I will have time, much time, to renew a relationship that was cruelly ended just as it had begun as it was getting started. I mention this story because the emotions I felt when my mother showed me the crumpled photo were the very same emotions I felt that February night in a college dorm room when I first believed in a God of love. Someone is there, I realized. Someone is watching life as it unfolds on this planet. More, someone is there who loves me. It was a startling feeling of wild hope, a feeling so new and overwhelming that it seemed fully worth the risk, to, worth risking my life on. Philip Yancey's story. Take away. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He loves you all. Romans 8, 31 to 32. If, if God is for us, who can be against us? He, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him Jesus up for us all. He hung back there on that cross, but he's not there anymore. And he's not there because they buried him, but it couldn't, the grave couldn't hold him and he rose again to everlasting life. And again, from point one, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh yeah, he definitely loves us. And nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's love is that powerful. It's that constant. It's that consistent in our lives. Even when we screw up, even when we mess up, even when we fall down flat, smack dab in the middle of a mud puddle, right? In the parable of the prodigal son, sometimes referred to as the lost son in Luke 15, the father in that parable represents God, okay? And in that parable, when the father sees his son in the distance, Returning from home, he picks up the hem of his toga and makes a beeline straight for him. Makes as much speed as he can possibly go, probably nearly tripping and falling like I described earlier. All the speed he can muster. And when he reaches him, what do you think he does? Does he smack him around a little bit or spank him on the butt? Heck no. He throws his arms around him. Throws his arms around him and gives him a great big hug and a kiss on the cheek. And then he initiates an estate-wide celebratory party where no expense is spared. You remember why this occasion happened, right? His son had returned to him after spurning his upbringing, turning his back on his father and his family, and squanders his entire inheritance in a short period of time. So great is the love of his father 
And my friends, so great is the love of our God. So if God can love us like this, don't you think we should display a little measure of that? A measure of his love toward others, toward those around us? Again, Galatians 5, to 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live by the Spirit. Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So today, let us be more loving because God loves us, and that is what God would have us to be. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you so much for what it has to tell us. And Lord, I pray that we have the fruit of the Spirit. And Lord, that at the heart of that is is the great characteristics of Christ and and the Holy Spirit working through us to present this, this fruit. Help us to love one another. There's a lot of awful things that go on in life and go on in our world. And, some, and life is short, and I think sometimes we forget it. We forget just how short it can be or how quickly it can end. So Lord, help us to love one another better. Help us not to part ways on a nasty note. Help us appreciate one another and truly love one another. And Lord, as we love one another, I pray that we do so, so well that others will know we're Christians by our love and that it's so genuine that it's something they want a part of so that they would come to the foot of the cross, they would come to the person of Jesus, accept him as their savior, and spend eternity with the family of God in heaven. Lord, bless these folks, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.